All right, like us if we could this morning to look at Ezekiel chapter 11, Ezekiel chapter 11, and I'm going to read from verse 1, although we did uh, cover the first three verses uh, last time, but uh, I just think it would be important for us for the connection. So we'll begin in verse 1, we'll read down to verse 13, and we're going to be thinking particularly this morning of uh, hope in the gloom. Uh, we get the first glimmer of hope in the prophecy of Ezekiel, uh, not only uh, hope of uh, restoration, but the hope of the new covenant is going to be introduced today, which is a pretty exciting thing. So uh, we're going to begin in verse one. It says this way, moreover, the spirit lifted me up and brought me onto the east gate of the Lord's house, which look, looketh eastward and behold at the door of the gate, five and 20 men among whom I saw Jazaniah, the son of Azur, and Pelatiah, the son of Beniah, princes of the people. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in this city, which say, It is not near. Let us build houses. This city is the cauldron, and we be the flesh. Therefore prophesy against them, prophesy, O son of man. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord, Thus have you said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. You have multiplied your slain in this city, and you have filled the streets thereof with the slain. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, your slain whom you have laid in the midst of it, they are the flesh, and this city is a cauldron. But I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. Ye have feared the sword, and I will bring a sword upon you, saith the Lord God. And I will bring you out of the midst thereof, and deliver you into the hands of strangers, and will execute judgment among you. You shall fall by the sword, I will judge you in the border of Israel. You shall know that I am the Lord." This city shall not be your cauldron, neither shall ye be the flesh in the midst thereof, but I will judge you in the border of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord, for you have not walked in my statutes, neither executed my judgments, but have done after the manners of the heathen that are round about you. And it came to pass when I prophesied that Pelatiah the son of Beniah died, then fell I down upon my face and cried with a loud voice and said, Our Lord God, wilt thou make a full end of the remnant of Israel? And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word. And certainly as we read that little section, I don't suppose you saw any glimmer of, of hope in the gloom in those verses. They actually come after verse 13. Yeah, but we'll get to them, Lord willing, this morning. So you'll get to see uh, the glimmer of hope in the gloom as we consider the new covenant a bit later. But we want to uh, break in uh, in verse 4, uh, where uh, he, uh, the prophet, is told to prophesy against them, these 25 leaders who had been giving uh, wicked counsel to the people, telling them to settle down and build houses and that they were secure. Uh, that uh, they're the flesh, the choice cuts of meat, and the city of Jerusalem is the cauldron, and they're going to be safe in the city walls and not to worry and build houses and all the rest of it. And so he's told to prophesy against them. And, uh, of course, he's uh, reminded uh, with this phrase, oh, son of man, of his own weakness. And, uh, of course, he's very much dependent on the Lord as he's coming against this rebellious nation. But it tells us, the spirit of the Lord fell upon me, in verse 5, and said to me, Speak, thus saith the Lord, thus have you said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. I would suggest that this might be a good gospel text, huh? I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. That's a kind of scary thought, isn't it? That the Lord knows every thought that runs through our heads. And one thing we could say is this, uh, that these men who were following their evil practices, often in hidden chambers, uh, this is a most important statement, for it declares that if the thoughts are open to God, then no darkness can ever hide anything from him. 
who sees and understands all things. In fact, the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews says this in chapter 4, verse 13. It says, all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so it really is uh, significant, isn't it? God knows everything. And so we need to be praying not only about our conduct, that we would be upright in our conduct, but Lord, help my thought life that I might think things that I will not be ashamed of because you even know my thoughts. Uh, what a challenging thing that God knows even our thoughts. And he knew the thoughts of these individuals and uh, he's letting them know that uh, nothing's hid from him. Of course, it's, it's quite relevant because uh, in previous chapters, we've seen that they said God doesn't see, nor does he nor does He care. He's indifferent and he, and he doesn't see. And God is emphasizing, yes, I do see. I even know what's going through your mind. And so in verse 6, it says, You have multiplied your slain in the city, and you have filled the streets thereof with the slain. Uh, so he reminds the leaders uh, and the people of their responsibility in the great judgment coming upon them. God's judgment was a response to their persistent deep rebellion. And there's no real suggestion that they have necessarily committed open murder in the streets, nor particularly that they have directly filled the streets with the slain, but indirectly their actions in not only themselves turning away from God, but through their counsel turning the people away from God had caused judgment to fall. And so in a sense, they were, they were indirectly through their actions uh, responsible for all the judgment and all the death that was about to be uh, meted out on the city. And so really, and again, people are responsible for their actions. And uh, it's amazing how counsel, uh, that is evil counsel, affects lives and costs lives. Decisions that are made uh, affects lives tremendously. I think of the, uh, again, in our own uh, society, the government decisions can result in the slaughter of the unborn. Those are serious things. Decisions made in, in council chambers uh, fills cities with with dead bodies. Uh, it's amazing to think of it. And so God is going to hold them accountable. And so he says in verse 7, Therefore, in the light of these decisions that they have made, the counsels that they have given, the, the results of their poor leadership, uh, which has caused people to go astray uh, from the Lord and brought about judgment, he says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, your slain whom you have laid in the midst of it, they are the flesh. And the city is the cauldron, but I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. And so, um, you know, they were boasting that they were the choice cuts. And he said, actually, the people who have died as a result of your poor leadership decisions, they're really the, the choice cuts. He's kind of turning uh, their defiant claim of confidence uh, into a prediction of doom. Uh, they wouldn't be protected in the cauldron they would be cooked and then devoured. The, the heat's going to be on them, and then they're going to be devoured. And so their own words spoken in mockery are wittily retorted upon them and driven back again down their throats, as it were. The Lord is, as it were, throwing it back upon them. No longer is Jerusalem a crock in which food is securely stored. Uh, she is a pot over the fire in which the meat is cooked. The real men of worth were the ones whose deaths they had caused. And so he says that uh, I will bring, the end of verse 7, I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. It's going to remove their protect, protection. It, through the devastation to come upon Jerusalem would be terrible. It would not be the last word. The story of Israel and Jerusalem would not end with the Babylonian captivity. Uh, they're going to be brought out of the city. Uh, they're going to be, as it were, scattered amongst the nations. We're going to see that as we move on in this chapter. And everywhere they are, they're going to suffer tremendously uh, uh, from the heathen nations. So he says, you have feared the sword, but I'll bring the sword upon you, verse 8, saith the Lord God. And I will bring you out in the midst thereof, deliver you into the hands of strangers, and will execute judgment among you. And so... Not everybody would perish in Jerusalem. God would send many into exile. 
when Jerusalem was destroyed, the judgments upon them would not end. God would continue to deal with his people at the border of Israel and beyond. And of course, as you look at the, the history of this nation, it seems like wherever they have been, uh, they have suffered tremendously. Uh, the pogroms in Russia, the Holocaust, the uh, I mean, just the their suffering has just seemingly been endless because of their rebellion against God and the subsequent judgments of it. Verse 10, it says, you shall fall by the sword. I will judge you in the border of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. I want you to think about this phrase, I will judge you in the border of Israel. Actually, in the northern border, even at a place called Ribla, is where these judgments took place. So we want to look at two portions of scripture that talk about these being brought out of the city and then how they would be judged at the border of the land. So Second Kings chapter 25 is the first one. And then we're going to look at Jeremiah 52. Uh, 2 Kings 25 is the first one. And we're going to look at three references in here that states God's going to judge them in the border of their land. And so it says, <clears throat> verse 6, so they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon to Ribla, and they gave judgment upon him. Again, chapter 25 and verse 21. And the king of Babylon smote them and slew them at Ribla in the land of Hamath. So Judah was carried away out of their land. Uh, in fact, uh, probably contextually, uh, it'd be good if we read from verse 18, just to see the bigger picture, it says, And the captain of the guard took Seriah, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the door. And out of the city he took an officer that was set over the men of war, and five men of them that were in the king's presence, which were found in the city, and the principal scribe of the host, which mustered the people of the land, and three score men of the people of the land that were found in the city, and Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, took these and brought them to the king of Babylon, to Ribla, and the king of Babylon smote them and slew them at Ribla in the land of Hamath. So Judah was carried away out of their land. So it's the kind of the principal leaders, high priests, all these others, they're going to be slain at Ribla. And that's what Ezekiel is referring to. Let's look at Jeremiah for parallel portion. Uh, again, in Jeremiah 52, where we see this prophecy of Ezekiel finding its fulfillment. And several references, 52.10, it says this, And the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. He slew also all the princes of Judah in Ribla. And then uh, verse 21, sorry, um, verse, sorry, verse 26 of chapter 52. So Nebuchadnezzar. Zeradan, the captain of the guard, took them, brought them to the king of Babylon to Ribla. And it says uh, in verse 27 of the king of Babylon smote them and put them to death in Ribla in the land of Hamath. Thus Judah was carried away captive out of the land. And so this promise, I will judge you at the border of Israel, meets its fulfillment and, uh, of course, th this is a true prophet of God. What he says comes to pass. Verse 11, he says, back in chapter 11, verse 11, This city shall not be your cauldron, neither shall you be the flesh in the midst thereof, but I will judge you in the border of Israel. Again, repetition of what we've seen. Uh, quoting their defiant claim to them one last time, Jerusalem would not be a protection for them at all, but they would be slain in the borders of Israel. And so verse 12, he says, you shall know that I am the Lord for you have not walked in my statutes, neither executed my judgments, but have done after the manners of the heathen that are round about you. And so he, as he's moved by the spirit of God, he um, alters uh, this imagery that they had given uh, of the, the being meat in a pot or cauldron and uh, basically, these righteous men who had been murdered in the city were really the chief ones. God is going to toss them out. Uh, they would not be safe as meat in a kettle, but he would drive them out and give them into the hands of foreigners. 
Yeah, so that was God's decree. God's dealing with his people after the fall of Jerusalem would be another way that he revealed himself to his people. He says, as a result of these things, you will know that I am the Lord. He'll know it because he reveals himself to them in judgment and discipline. They will know that I am the Lord. He would not, however, give up on them. Uh, he's going to discipline them. And we're going to see that, but there's a lot more to it. Notice in verse 13, the certainty of coming judgment. And here God shows what he intends to do in a very stark way. Because remember, when we started our reading, it talks about some of the these 25 men. It mentions two of them uh, in verse 1, Jazanir, the son of Azur, and Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. And so as he's giving his prophecy, look at what verse 13 says, it came to pass when I prophesied, that Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, died. Then fell I down upon my face and cried with a loud voice and said, Our Lord God, wilt thou make a full end of the remnant of Israel? And so Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, died just as Ezekiel was prophesying. And it was a confirmation of Ezekiel's message and foreshadowed the judgment that would soon destroy Jerusalem's wicked leaders. It's almost like God is giving them a, a case in point. He's, he's giving them a foreshadowing of what he intends to do with these, these wicked leaders. And so in a sudden startling statement, Ezekiel announces that as he was prophesying, Pelatiah, son of Benaiah, died. There could hardly have been a more distinct testimony to the reality of Ezekiel's prophetic ministry, since Pelatiah means Jehovah delivers, and Benaiah means Jehovah has built. And so although this man had all these spiritual names, it's not the outward that God considers, but the heart. This man didn't live up to these names, uh, and uh, it, it means nothing in a sense. It's like when God talks about the church at Sardis. You have a name that you live, but you're dead. And so he, again, just... Uh, the name meant nothing. It's the character that matters. And so this man is being judged for his wickedness as a foreshadowing of what God intends to do uh, with the rest of the leaders of Israel. As a result of this, Ezekiel himself wonders if the Lord would make a full end of the remnant of Israel. And so he, he he cries out again. He's just moved by this judgment. And it says, Then fell I down upon my face and cried with a loud voice and said, Ah, oh Lord God, will thou make a full end of the remnant of Israel? And, and so uh, we've seen this before. We saw it in chapter 9 and verse 8, where, uh, again, there's an outburst from the prophet. And again, we, we said before, even though he's got a hard head, God had given him this hard forehead, he still has a tender heart. And it bothers him when he sees these things happen. Uh, chapter 9, verse 8, it came to pass while he was slaying them, and I was left, that I fell on my face and cried, said, Our Lord God, will thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out with thy fury uh, upon Jerusalem. And so he reminds us a little bit of the Apostle Paul, doesn't he, Who, whose heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel was that they might be saved. Uh, he has such a heart, that uh, for, tender heart for these people, and he doesn't want them to be destroyed, and he's crying out to God. And of course, it's good to ask ourselves, do we have a heart for the lost? Do we have a heart for Israel? Do we have a heart for a lost and dying world? Uh, do, we, do we ever fall on our faces and cry out before God uh, on behalf of others? And certainly we see that in this individual. Now, of course, the answer to his petition uh, will you make a full end of the remnant of your people? Uh, actually, Jeremiah gives us the answer to that question. Let's just look at Jer one verse in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 46 and verse 28, a, a lovely scripture, uh, one that gives hope for the nation of Israel. Fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee, for I will make a full end of all the nations whither I have driven thee, but I will not make a full end of thee. But correct thee in measure, yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished. And so there still is hope for the nation of Israel. Not going to make a full end. Uh, he still has a plan for that people. 
and he's still got, got purposes for them. In fact, it leads us into this section that we mentioned where there is some hope in the midst of the gloom. And this is where we get into promises of the return of God's people after the Babylonian captivity and a message of comfort for those that are in captivity. And so we notice it says in verse 14, again, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, perhaps in direct response to Ezekiel's heart cry here, here's, here's God's response. It says, son of man, verse 15, thy brethren, even thy brethren, the men of thy kindred and all the house of Israel, holy are they unto whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, get you far from the Lord unto us in this land given in possession. So again, this uh, re new revelation prefaced with son of man, again, reminded of his own weakness, but Jehovah's strength for the tasks that are given to him. And so he speaks again of thy brethren and the men of thy kindred, uh, clearly those of the captivity among whom the prophet is to be found, but also the whole house of Israel already carried away long before are in view here. And the word he uses when he talks about kindred is a derivative of a word we might be familiar with. Uh, it's the word kinsman redeemer, bringing into prominence the thought of their kinship, a near kinship of spiritual condition rather than necessarily physical relationships. Ezekiel's brothers in exile were the true remnant that would not be destroyed. And so from verse 16 down to verse 20, we have a promise of regathering and the new covenant to encourage those in exile. So notice verse 16. He says, Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, Although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. So first of all, there's a promise for those who are carried into captivity amongst the nations. So God says, <clears throat> therefore say, that is in view of the boasting of those in Jerusalem, going to set things right. He's going to talk not so much about those in Jerusalem who felt they were choice cuts of meat, but he's going to talk about those who are already in captivity, who they viewed as kind of the awful, the, uh, you know, the kind of poor cuts of meat. He gives a glimmer of hope to them in the midst of the gloom. And he talks about, uh, he's going to scatter them afar off, but he'll be to them in their scattering, a little sanctuary in the countries. Now, we would say this, a partial restoration took place after the Babylonian captivity, but the prophecy we're going to look at from 16 onwards goes far beyond that time and looks to the ultimate regathering of Israel before the millennial kingdom. And so we want to keep in view, uh, yes, there's a near fulfillment, but we we'll want to think about a far fulfillment as well. And the message is that all, he who cast them off, uh, far off among the heathen, scattered them among the nations, yet there he will be to them where they are as a little sanctuary. Now, the Hebrew word for little here is not so much a, a measure of size or a, or a time connotation. And so there's a lot of division. Now, what does this mean? Some think it means for a little while. For a little while, while they're dispersed amongst the nations, God would be to them a sanctuary he would be uh, there for them uh, of course uh, some suggest that it, it little in the, in the idea of uh, the personal nature of the sanctuary for those in exile each one will have his own experience of god uh, in in wherever they are dwelt uh, amongst the nations a little personal sanctuary and just look at Isaiah 8. We want to just look at this idea of a, a sanctuary again from the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah 8, verse 13 and 14. It says, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself 
and let him be your fear and let him be your dread and he shall be for a sanctuary but for a stone, stone of stumbling for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel and for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And so the idea is this, that in their exile, the Lord would either be a sanctuary for them or a snare and a stumbling block for them. It'll be one or the other, depending how they respond. But he is promising for those that have a heart for him, he would be a sanctuary for them. He would be a, a safe dwelling place for them. But to others, he would be a stumbling block. And of course, uh, it's an interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, some have suggested that the whole synagogue movement came as a result of this verse, that where they were scattered, they they they, they couldn't recreate the temple because that had to be in Jerusalem. But they built these little sanctuaries wherever they were scattered. And it was places where they would keep the memory of Jehovah God alive and 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 interact with the things of God. But in the real sense, I think, on a practical level, uh, isn't it wonderful that uh, a sanctuary is the idea of a, a dwelling place of God? Uh, that's uh, and, a, and a place of, uh, of refuge, a place of of peacefulness. And, and it's wonderful, isn't it, that wherever we are in the world, we can have that intimate relationship with God and he can be for us a little sanctuary. We can have a dwelling place where we can enjoy communion with the most high God. And so he says, he promises, I'll be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Then he says this, therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you've been scattered and I will give you the land of Israel. So here's a promise. Even though because of their rebellion and their disobedience, much of their uh, latter history has been one of being scattered. But there is a promise, I will give you the land of Israel. Kind of interesting because it's his to give. Uh, Ezekiel is going to tell us over and over again as we pro progress in the book, he's going to talk about that land being my land. And so because it's his land, he can give it to whomsoever he chooses. And he's telling them that he's going to give them this land. It's a promise. Of course, it's a promise that goes back a long way to Abraham and his descendants. He said, I'm, I'm going to give you this land. Verse 18, he says, and they shall come thither and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof from thence. And so again, they're going to, when they return to the land, and of course, we remember we said we saw that in a measure uh, when they returned after the Babylonian captivity, they're going to leave behind their detestable idols. Babylon, the overdose of idolatry, means that when they go back, they leave the idols behind them. And there'll be no more uh, groves to Ashtaroth. Uh, there'll be no more altars to Baal. Uh, when they return, they will leave all that behind. And so there's a promise. Uh, it says, they shall turn away the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof thence. They're going to leave them behind. Upon returning to the land, these things will not be an issue again. But here's where it gets exciting in verse 19 and 20. He says, I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you and I will take away the, I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Now, I want you to notice, and this is really significant when we look at verses 19 and 20, the number of times it says, I will. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh, then they that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And so uh, one thing we know is when we study the covenants of Scripture, there are some covenants that we call conditional covenants where God basically says, if you do this, I will do this. 
And so, that, for instance, the Mosaic Law, all that the Lord has given us, we will do it. It was a conditional covenant. It was based on their obedience. But when we see covenants like the New Covenant, one of the things about it is that it's unconditional. It's not based on them. It's based on God. I will do this. I will do this. And it's a wonderful thing to know that God is going to do those things. Now, even though there's no specific reference here to the term new covenant, how we know that this is new covenant teaching is because it parallels Jeremiah 31 verses 31 through 34. And so I want to just to turn there and see where the term new covenant is used. And so let's look at Jeremiah 31. And this is really important teaching. The covenants of scripture is a fascinating study, uh, a neglected study, one you don't hear much teaching on, but they're, they're very significant. In our conversational Bible reading, we've been doing the covenant with Noah, the no Noahic covenant from Genesis chapter 9. And again, that word covenant is used over and over again. Chapter 31 of, of Jeremiah, verse 31, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. So that's the what we call the old covenant or the Mosaic covenant. They broke that. But this shall be the covenant, verse 33, that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts, write it in their hearts, will be their God. They shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, and I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. Now, also, as well as Ezekiel 12, even the, the, we saw here there's parallel, sorry, it's Ezekiel 11, uh, this parallel of I give them one heart, put a new spirit within you, take the stony heart of your flesh, that parallels Jeremiah 31. But also Ezekiel 36 also reiterates a coming day when God will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Even though it doesn't use the term, it gives the same uh, exact experience. And so we want just to read from Ezekiel 36, 24 through 27. Again, amazing passage. And again, notice the I wills. Uh, so it says, verse 24, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I'll take away the stony heart of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh and I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And verse 28, you shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. So this idea of the new covenant, what a wonderful glimmer of hope within the gloom promising of restoration to the land, promising that when he does ultimately restore them to the land, he's going to give them a new heart. They're not going to be those rebellious people anymore. They're going to have a new spirit within them. He's going to remove that stony heart and, and give it a tender, soft heart. This is what God is going to do. And it, it is quite significant, really, when we look at these verses um, when God takes up the work, there's a great difference. I'm going to do these things. He's going to give them this heart. He's going to put a new spirit within them. They'll walk in his statutes, keep his ordinances. And of course, what he's talking about really is the new birth. That's why he says to Nicodemus, are you a teacher in Israel and you don't know these things? When he says you must be born again, it was you've got to have a new heart and a new beginning and a new start. You've got to experience what it is to be born from above. 
And, and of course, he says to Ezekiel, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so it's really interesting, isn't it, that that he really, we could paraphrase, and it's almost like he's saying to Nicodemus, did you not read Ezekiel? How could you be ignorant of these things? This is what God has promised. Now, of course, we might ask the question, because we read there in Jeremiah, that this is a new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And we might ask the question, well, where does that leave us? Because we're not the house of Israel and we're not the house of Judah. But we would all say that one of the wonderful things, the most wonderful things that's ever happened to us is we've been born again. And as we break bread from week to week, we take a cup and we're told by the Lord himself, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So how is it that we, sinners of the Gentiles, somehow get in on the spiritual blessings of the new covenant. Now, not all the blessings. The land of Israel is not ours. <laughs> He's never given that to us or promised that to us. But this amazing thing of a new heart and a new spirit is something God has given to us. And so how is it that we could ever get into this new covenant? And of course, the, the answer is simple. We have believed on Israel's Messiah. And as a result of our belief in Israel's Messiah, we've experienced the new birth that was promised to the nation of Israel. Of course, go back to John chapter three. How does how do you he says how does this happen? How do I how do I become born again? Do I have to go back in my mother's womb? And he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so when we looked to the uplifted Savior who was bearing our sin on Calvary's cross, amazing miracle occurred called the new birth. And now when we take that cup, one of the great truths of the new covenant is this, your sins and your iniquities, I will remember them no more. And of course, what a wonderful thing it is for us to take that cup and to remember him and know that our sins will never be brought up before us again. God will never call them to remembrance ever again because they were dealt with in full on Calvary's cross. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is to experience the blessing of the new birth and to enter into the spiritual benefits of the new covenant in this wonderful age we call the age of the new testament or the age of the new covenant and again it will ultimately find its fulfillment with the house of israel and the house of judah there is a day coming when they will look upon him whom they've pierced and they'll mourn for him as one mourns for an only begotten son. And then a fountain will be opened for sin and uncleanness. And they will be a nation who will be born again in one day. And they will enter into all the blessings of the new covenant. There'll be a new people with a new heart. And they'll enter into that land that was long promised to their fathers. They will be given to them. And they'll be an altogether different people. No longer a rebellious nation but a people subjected to the Lord through the power of the new birth. And so how marvelous it is to get that glimmer of hope in the midst of the gloom, all this judgment, and yet here's this beautiful picture of a future hope for the nation of Israel. And of course, the Lord Jesus is the only hope for Israel, just as he's the only hope for humanity. Without Christ, there is no hope. So it says... In verse 20, that they may walk in my statutes, keep mine ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people and I will be their God. And so as a result of this new birth, there'll be a new inclination to obedience and there'll be a new intimacy with God. They'll have a real relationship with God. It won't be just all outward sham. It'll be reality. It'll be a living, vital relationship with the living God. 
then Israel will permanently be indwelt by the Holy Spirit rather than is just coming on them for acts of service like you see in the Old Testament, but he will come upon them permanently. And in the millennial kingdom, the Holy Spirit will indwell, indwell believing Israelites who will walk in his ways and will have a relationship with God. So much so, so real will be their relationship that Gentiles will get hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, tell me about your God. Oh, what a difference is going to be. Uh, they're going to be people who kn the world knows that they know their God. All this mention all through this uh, prophecy that they shall know that I am the Lord. Well, there's a day coming when they will know experientially that he is the Lord and he'll be their Lord. And there'll be one Lord and his name one, and they will follow him and worship him. What a day that will be. So leads us to verse 21. And it says, but as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations are recompensed their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. Remember we saw in Isaiah that the Lord will either be a sanctuary or a stumbling block. And there'll be those that respond to him and there'll be those that reject him. There'll be those that still hold on to abominable things and they'll be recompensed their way upon their own heads. Those that craved after these detestable and abominable things, their punishment is just and right in relation to what they would do. They will receive a full reward of their deeds because God is a God of justice. So verse 22, it says, Then did the cherubim lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. The glory of the, the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. So again, remember this 8 through 11. It's the Ichabod chapters. God's glory leaving from above the, the Ark of the Covenant, moving out to the threshold of the house, then to the east gate. And now the final movement is to the Mount of Olives. God's glory leaving Jerusalem goes over the Kidron Valley and goes to the Mount of Olives. Of course, that Mount of Olives is going to feature significantly in future scriptures. It's from that place that the one who John says, we beheld his glory, none other than our Lord Jesus, will leave the city of Jerusalem and go out the east gate and go up to the Mount of Olives. And of course, in a coming day, he will return. And where will he return to? He'll return in glory. We know that. He will return, tells us in Zechariah, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives in that day. And we see in Ezekiel 43, the glory of God returning first of all to the Olivet Mount and then coming through the East Gate and into the sanctuary again. And of course, when he comes, the one who indeed in him dwells, <laughs> the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the one who glory dwells in, uh, the Lord Jesus, when he comes, they will say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. God has certainly showed his long suffering with these people. How it almost seems so slow, this movement of the glory of God. In fact, the Jewish rabbis, uh, according to them, the glory remained on Olivet for three and a half years in the hope that Israel would repent. And only when it was clear there was no possibility of repentance did the glory depart now again scripture doesn't say that that's what the rabbis say but it does t give us a little glimpse of the long suffering of god certainly we would say this he wasn't in a rush to leave it was only when there was no possibility of repentance when their hearts had become so hardened that he leaves the sanctuary and from this point on uh, until the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple would be an empty shell. 
they still carry on the ritual at the temple, but he's not there. He's gone. And they'll just carry on business as usual. It 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 will be just like the Laodicean church. Business as usual, but the Lord is not in the midst. I, I'm sure maybe even some of them, as they go to the Laodicean assembly, carrying their Bibles under their arms, are saying, oh, isn't it good the Lord's in our midst? But the Lord was outside knocking on the door. They, he had departed. The glory had departed, <laughs> and they didn't even realize it. So we now reach verse 24. It says, Afterwards the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God unto Chaldea, to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. So he's basically transported back. You know, he'd been carried uh, in this vision to Jerusalem to see the, the abominations that were going on there, to see why God was going to judge Jerusalem. Now God's servant is brought back again and finds himself once again uh, in uh, by the banks of the Kibar in Chaldee, the, the, amongst the Chaldeans, them of the captivity. And then it says this, so the vision that I had seen went up from me, and then I spake unto them, it was a vision came to an end. So I spake unto them of the captivity all the things that the Lord had assured me. And it must have been an uncomfortable account for the elders to listen to. Do you remember that they had come to his house to see, is there any word from the Lord? They come with hope that the message was going to be that this Exile is temporary. We're going back to Jerusalem. Everything's going to be fine again. And instead, he tells them of the absolute destruction of Jerusalem and why that's necessary. And no doubt, they would have found it very unpalatable to hear his message. And again, sometimes when we get a message from God, it's not one we particularly enjoy. Especially when it's one that's convicting when it's one of judgment, when it's one that really speaks to the reality of the situation. In fact, we'd rather have smooth words and uh, we'd rather have kind of almost unrealistic messages that make us feel good. But he delivers the message as he received it from the Lord. And of course, that message would have been very unpalatable, hard for them to hear. But he says, I spake unto them of the captivity all the things that the Lord had showed me. And that's what we've been looking at, all the things the Lord has shown him. Now, we're going to turn the page, and we'll just spend a minute here. We're not going to spend long in chapter 12 because our time is almost gone. But when we get into chapter 12, we start in a new section that's going to go all the way through chapter 24. And in this section... You, you, you could put it this way, it's all their objections objections to judgment. Now, they're going to raise these objections, but they're going to be demolished by the Lord. And there are some of the objections that are answered in this extended section. We've heard all this before, but it hasn't happened. And of course, that how relevant that is today. There, there are people who when we talk about coming judgment, when we talk about end time events, just like the scoffers in Second Peter, they'll say, where's the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have from the beginning. So the, that attitude of, uh, we've heard all this before, it hasn't happened. And it is interesting, isn't it, that, that God's long suffering, instead of bringing men to repentance, <laughs> It causes men to think, oh, well, judgment's not coming, which is tragic, really, isn't it? God is, is giving them opportunity, and they're spurning the opportunity. We've heard it all before. It hasn't happened. Also, they're objecting to judgment because they're believing a message of false prophets who are saying, we're going to be safe. We're going to be delivered. And so there's this 
this unrealistic optimism because of men like Hananiah who give messages that we're, we're okay, settle down, build your houses, we're not going anywhere, we're going to be fine here. And then a third kind of prong of objection is this, God would never do this to his people or to his city. And so there are these messages that have been given that are basically saying, God's not going to judge us. We're going to be fine. What's going to happen is, <clears throat> once again, when we get to chapter 12, he's going to do some acting again. It's time for, Isra uh, for Ezekiel to put on his acting garments again. And he's going to act out two parables in chapter 12, and then he's going to answer two objections. So that's where we're headed. But for now, this is probably a good time to rest <laughs> and end our section. But isn't it good that in the midst of the gloom, there's a glimmer of hope, that hope of a new covenant with Israel, restored to the land, completely regenerated and new creatures, and also walking in his ways. Oh, what a glorious future. And of course, Paul says, if their rejection be, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, brought the gospel to the gen. how much will their restoration be? He said it's going to be like life from the dead. And so we get a little glimmer in the midst of all this gloom of a coming day when this nation will be restored and what a blessing that will bring to all the nations. And they that have been the heel of the nations will be the head of the nations in a coming day. May the Lord encourage us with these thoughts.